Hello everybody, Chaplain Bob here, Light of the World Ministries. John 8, 12, Jesus said, I am the light of the world. He that followeth me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. This is going to be part two on the um, falling away. And uh, in Judges chapter four, we just read where Deborah and Barak had won a great victory. Of course, the Lord handed it to them. You know, that's the thing. The Lord wanted Israel to go into the land and exterminate the Canaanites, which very few churches will teach it, but uh, Genesis 6, the giants, you know, so... All right, so let's read Judges chapter 5. They're singing the praises of the Lord for their victory. Verse 1, Then sang Deborah and Barak, the son of Abinoam, on that day, saying, Praise ye the Lord for the avenging of Israel, when the people willingly offered themselves. Hear, O ye kings, Give ear, O ye princes, I, even I, will sing unto the Lord. I will sing praise to the Lord God of Israel. People, if uh, your faith causes you to be cast into prison, to lose everything in this world that you own, and you're scheduled to be executed for your faith in Christ, or to deny him to save your flesh, can you sing the praises of the Lord? And trust me, I'm not trying to puff myself up because, you know, uh, does any of us know what will happen until that time actually occurs? You know, there's a verse in the Bible about counting the cost. And it likens it up to somebody that wants to build a home or a tower, you know, you don't want to start building a building project and then you run out of the money before you finish it. But that's the physical application, the earthly application. But what's the spiritual application? Are you willing to endure unto the end? Are you willing to give everything that you have, including your life? to follow Christ? I mean, Christ died for you. Did you? Would you be willing to do the same for him? Uh, you better believe that the great majority, probably 90% of the church people, and I'm just guessing, I don't know. I don't claim to be a prophet. I don't claim to have any special knowledge. I just know what uh, my last 30 some odd years of studying the Bible and observing people uh, that's all I've got to go by. But uh, I, I just, I'm of the opinion, 90% of the church people, if, when it comes time to die for the faith, they'll deny the faith rather than die for the faith. Die for the faith or deny the faith. That's going to be their choice. Uh, especially, look into the, into the Noahide laws, N-O-A-H-I-D-E, um, there's laws on the books right now where they can kill every Christian. And, you know, they'll... You have to really dig. I mean, you know, the, the children of the devil, uh, they will put up so much disinformation, especially on the first pages of Google. Um, you know, usually when I'm searching something, uh, sometimes I start on page three or four because that's where you start finding the real information, because page one is usually just full of disinformation. But uh, there's a guy named uh, Robert Pickle. He, uh, he has a lot of information on the Noahide laws. And uh, he's the real deal. So, 
If you're thrown into prison and you're scheduled to be executed, will you sing praises to the Lord God of Israel? Verse 4. Lord, when thou wentest out of Seir. Now, what was Seir? Mount Seir was the land of Esau, Edom. Okay. Lord, when thou wentest out of Seir, when thou marchest out of the field of Edom, the earth trembled and the heavens dropped. The clouds also dropped water. Now, Bob's note here. If you look up in the Jewish Encyclopedia and you look up Esau, Edom, at least in the past, I've noticed the new, uh, some of the newer references have been taken away. It says that Edom is in modern Jewry today. Josephus said that King Herod was of Esau, Edom. You know, the guy that killed all the children in Bethlehem? Oh yeah, that, that Herod. Matter of fact, when Pilate sent Jesus to Herod uh, at the, uh, after the Sanhedrin had grabbed him and had a trial and put him, wanted to put him to death, uh, Pilate didn't want anything to do with it. So he says, oh, you're from Galilee. Okay, so he sent him to, to Herod. Well, Herod wanted to see Jesus do a magic trick. But do you know that Jesus didn't say not one word to Herod? Not one word. Nothing. In Mark 3, verse 6, we read, And the Pharisees went forth and straightway took counsel with the Herodians, that's the children of Herod, you know, the family, Herod's family, and straightway took counsel with the Herodians against him, Jesus, how they might destroy him. Oh, yeah. All right, let's go to Luke chapter 23, and then we're going to go back to Judges uh, 5. And this is how Jesus uh, dealt with the Herodians, Herod, who were, in, according to Jesus, Josephus, a Jewish historian, was of the Edomites, which intermarried with the Canaanites, the Hittites. And let me tell you something. I, I did a study on Esau, Edom. And yeah, I know the blacks that claim to be Hebrews will tell you that white people are the children of Herod. Well, there are some people that look white that are of Esau, Edom, but not all of us. So, all right, Luke 23, verse 1. And the whole multitude of them arose and led him, Jesus, unto Pilate. And they began to accuse him, saying, We found this fellow perverting the nation and forbidding to give tribute to Caesar, which is a lie. You know, Jesus said to give to Caesar the things that are Caesar's and give to God the things that are God's. You know, when he asked him to, you know, show me the penny, and he said, Whose image and superscription is on this? And they said, Caesar's. And Jesus said, well, give the things to Caesar that belongs to Caesar. So, you know, here it is. They're worried about uh, tithing and, you know, not walking too far on a Sabbath day. And they were worried about him healing people on a Sabbath day. But, but they had no problem lying uh, to put somebody to death. We found this fellow, Jesus, perverting the nation and forbidding to give tribute to Caesar, saying that he himself is Christ, a king. I can hear him. And Pilate asked him, saying, Art thou the king of the Jews? And he answered him and said, Thou sayest it. In other words, if you say so. Then said Pilate to the chief priest and to the people, I find no fault in this man. Oh, yeah. And yet these lying preachers will tell you that the Romans put Jesus, uh, killed Jesus. No. No. Pilate did not. Had, he, he wanted to let him go. He wanted nothing to do with this. And like I've mentioned many times, I will guarantee you that Pilate had sent spies to, to keep an eye on Christ. And uh, 
saw that he was of he was no danger. I mean, you know, when you got crowds of five thousand people following you, uh, if you're a ruler, you're going to be worried about you know rebellion and riots and things of that nature, you know. And I find no fault in this man. And they were the more fierce, saying, He stirreth up the people, uh, teaching throughout all Jewry, beginning from Galilee to this place. When Pilate heard of Galilee, he asked whether the man were a Galilean. And as soon as he knew that he belonged unto Herod's jurisdiction, he sent him to Herod, who himself also was at Jerusalem at that time. Now remember something. Herod uh, had spent big bucks on the temple. Not because he wanted to honor God, but be, because he wanted control. You know, they always want control. They want to control the money. They want to control the politics. They want to control the religion. You know. All right, so. And as soon as he knew that he belonged, Jesus, unto Herod's jurisdiction, he sent him to Herod, who himself also was at Jerusalem at that time. Okay. And when Herod saw Jesus, he was exceeding glad. For he was desirous to see him of a long season, because he had heard many things of him, and he hoped to have seen some miracle done by him. Yeah, Herod wanted to see a magic show. Listen carefully. Then he questioned him, uh, questioned with him in many words, but he, Jesus, but he answered him nothing. He didn't say a word to Herod, nothing. He didn't even consider this dog worth speaking to. And the chief priests and scribes stood and vehemently accused him, Jesus. And Herod with his men of war set him at naught and mocked him and arrayed him in a gorgeous robe and sent him again to Pilate. So, there you go. All right, let's go back to Judges chapter 5. Verse 4, Lord, when thou wentest out of Seir, when thou marchest out of the field of Edom, the earth trembled and the heavens dropped, the clouds also dropped water. The mountains melted from before the Lord, even that Sinai from before the Lord God of Israel. You know, that's, uh, that's a future prophecy. Now remember, Edom and Moab and Canaan are what uh, some people often refer to as the serpent seed. Exodus chapter 15, verse 13. Thou, that's God, thou in thy mercy hast led forth the people which thou hast redeemed. That's salvation, people. Thou hast guided them in thy strength unto thy holy habitation. The people shall hear and be afraid. Sorrow shall take hold on the inhabitants of Palestina. Then the dukes of Edom shall be amazed, the mighty men of Moab, trembling, shall take hold upon them. All the inhabitants of Canaan shall melt away. All the inhabitants of Canaan shall melt away. Fear and dread shall fall upon them by the greatness of thine arm. They shall be as still as a stone till thy people pass over, O Lord, O Lord till the people pass over which thou hast purchased. And Christ has purchased us with his blood. Psalms 46.6 The heathen raged, the kingdoms were moved. He uttered his voice, the earth melted. Book of Nahum 1 and verse 5 The mountains quake at him and the hills melt, and the earth is burned at his presence, yea, the world and all that dwell therein. And here we go. 
2 Peter, verse 3, verse 10, 11, and 12. But, uh, but the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night, in the which the heavens shall pass away with a great noise, and the elements shall melt, melt with fervent heat. The earth also and the works therein that are therein shall be burned up. Seeing then that all these things shall be dissolved, what manner of persons ought ye to be in all holy conversation and godliness? Looking for and hastening unto the coming of the day of God, wherein the heavens being on fire shall be dissolved, and the elements shall melt, melt with fervent heat. Nevertheless, we, according to his promise, look for new heavens and a new earth, wherein dwelleth righteousness. Why? Because all the wicked are burned up. Gone. Okay, let's go back to Judges 5 and verse 5. The mountains melted from before the Lord. You know, it's funny. The Bible can talk about something in the uh in the pres uh, pr in the present, you know, in the presence of in the present time, can talk about something that is future, or in the past sometimes, but can talk about the future as if it's the present time. But you got to realize something, and this is where a lot of people get messed up. When the Holy Spirit is speaking through somebody. They're looking at things from God's perspective, not ours. You know, when John said, in a little while, this is going to happen. Well, you know, the Bible says the day with the Lord is as a thousand years and a thousand years as a day. So, you know, to us, it's like, you know, to the Lord, it's like, yeah, I'll do it. In a, you know, I'll take care of it in a couple of days. But for us, it's thousands of years. And then the people will use their little minds to interpret God's, uh, God's way and his thoughts. And they say, well, you know, if it was just a little while, a couple thousand years is not a little while. Well, to God it is. Not to you, not to me. You know, a couple thousand years. I'd, you know, if I was born a couple thousand years ago, I'd have been dead for a long time. But... Uh, I don't know. And that's the thing. Uh, you have to realize, you have to look at things from the Lord's perspective, not human perspective. We have a beginning and an end of our flesh on earth. He doesn't. So, the mountains melted from before the Lord, even that Sinai from before the Lord God of Israel, in the days of Shemgar, the son of Anath, in the days of Jael, the highways were unoccupied and the travelers walked through byways. The inhabitants of the villages ceased. They ceased in Israel until that I, Deborah, arose. That I arose a mother in Israel. They choose new gods. There was war in the gates. Was there a shield or spear a uh, seen among 40,000 in Israel? My heart is toward the governors of Israel. They offered themselves willingly among the people. Bless ye the Lord. Speak, ye that ride on white asses, ye that sit in judgment and walk by the way, they that are delivered from the noise of archers in the places of drawing water. There shall they rehearse the righteous acts of the Lord, even the righteous acts toward the inhabitants, inhabitants of his villages in Israel. Then shall the people of the Lord go down to the gates. Awake, awake, Deborah, awake, awake. Utter a song, arise, Barak, and lead thy captivity captive, thou son of Abinoah. Now what does it mean to take captivity captive? Well, that would be like if you were in prison and you escaped from prison and then you took your jailers 
your prison guards and put them in prison. And that's what they did. They took the people, the Canaanites that were holding them captive and made them the captives. They switched places with them, right? Verse 13. Then he made him that remaineth have dominion over the nobles among the people. The Lord made me have dominion over the mighty. And if you don't know what dominion means, it comes from the same root word as dominate. Verse 14. Out of Ephraim was there a root of them against Amalek. Now, Amalek was a grandson of Esau. I mentioned it in the last video, part one. Uh, God is going to have war with Amalek from generation to generation. Out of Ephraim was there a root of them against Amalek. After the Benjamin, among my people, out of Machir came down governors, and out of Zebulun, they that handle the pen of the writer. And the princes of Is Issachar were with Deborah, even Issachar and also Barak. He was sent on foot into the valley for the divisions of Reuben. There were great thoughts of heart. Divisions of Reuben. You know, God called Israel an army when they came out of Egypt. And uh, I'm not sure if in this instance when they talk about divisions, if they're talking about a size of a military unit or if they're talking about dividing something. Could be either way. I, you know, I, I, don't, I don't have it all figured out. When I do, I want somebody to give me a swift kick in the rear. Uh, verse 16. Why abodest thou among the sheepfold to hear the bleeding of the flocks? For the divisions of Reuben, there were great searchings of heart. Gilead abode beyond Jordan, and why did Dan remain in ships? You know, this would be a good thing to, to mention. Dan, the tribe of Dan, one of the 12 tribes, was known to be a seafaring people because they became a great multitude and the land that the Lord had allotted them was too small for their the numbers. So they were a seagoing people. And they were associated with the Phoenicians. But uh, do you know that the many places in Europe have the name Dan in it? You ever heard of the river Danube? Dan, Ub, and uh, if you look at Denmark, well, we call it Denmark, D-E-N, Mark, but they don't. You know how they spell it? Dan, Mark, the Mark of Dan. The Vikings. I'm, I'm of the opinion. I bet you. Oh, I did a video on it. Several videos, actually that uh, the Vikings were probably related to the tribe of Dan. I mean, they were an ocean-going people. They, they went all over. But uh, they weren't exactly the most faithful tribe, if you catch my drift. So, and why did Dan remain in ships? Asher continued on the seashore and abode in his breaches. Zebulun and Naphtali were a people that jeopardized their lives unto the death in the high places of the field. The kings came and fought, then fought the kings of Canaan in Tainach by the rivers of Megiddo. They took no gain of money. They fought from heaven. The stars in their courses fought against Sisera. Now, sometimes stars is talking about lights in the sky at night. Other times, stars are talking about angels. Verse 21. The river of Kishon swept them away. That ancient river, the river Kishon, O oh my soul, thou hast trodden down strength. They were the horse hooves broken. Oh, then were the horse hooves broken by the means of the prancings, the prancings of their mighty ones. From what I understand, prancing is 
kind of like a dance that uh, horses do. It's not a gallop. It's not a walk. And it's not running. It's, I don't know, kind of like a dance. I don't know. Curse ye, Merah, saith the angel of the Lord. Curse ye bitterly the inhabitants thereof, because they came not to the help of the Lord, to the help of the Lord against the mighty. Blessed above women shall Jael, the wife of Heber, the Kenite, be. Blessed shall be above women in the tent. He asked water, and she gave him milk. She brought forth butter in a lordly dish. She put her hand to the nail and her right hand to the workman's hammer, and with the hammer she smote Sisera. She smote off his head, and when she had pierced and stricken through his temples, at her feet he bowed, he fell. He lay down, at her feet he bowed, he fell. Where he bowed, there he fell down, dead. The mother of Sisera, looking out at a window, and cried through the lattice, Why is his chariot so long in coming? Why tarry the wheels of his chariots? Her wise ladies answered her, Yea. She returned answer to herself, Have they not sped? Have they not divided the prey? To every man a damsel or two, to Sisera a prey of divers colors, a prey of divers colors of needlework, of divers colors of needlework on both sides meet for the necks of them that take the spoil. So let all thine enemies perish, O Lord. Did you know the Lord has enemies? Boy, if you listen to your demon nominational church, they'll tell you, well, you know, everybody can be a friend of the Lord. You know, they just got to believe. Believe in Jesus. That's it. You know, now, the Lord has enemies, in, uh, had enemies in heaven, and has enemies on the earth. So let all thine enemies perish, O Lord, but let them that love him be as the sun when he goeth forth in his might, and the land had rest forty years." People were going to read Judges chapter 6. I was thinking about doing a series on Judges, but uh, I guess we'll just do this. Judges chapter 6. Think about America. Think about Europe. Think about the rich people that oppress what was formerly the middle class. There's not going to be a middle class by the time this uh, corona thing happens. Uh, that's my opinion. But I, I don't think there's going to be a middle class. There are so many people that were living paycheck to paycheck. And here it is. They've been off for, well, as of now, I think it's like five or five weeks. I mean, you know, and I bet you all these people claiming unemployment, I bet you the states aren't even going to pay them because the states don't have the money. The federal government's just printing money. You're going to watch... I bet you we're going to have 25% inflation on every item within the next probably six months because of all this money that the uh, Fed is printing. I mean, that's that's what they're doing, you know. There's no gold in Fort Knox, people. It's in the it's in the safes and vaults of the uh, the evil ones. All right. Judges chapter 6. Oh, and for those of you that don't know it, yes, I took two semesters of economics in business college. Not Bible college, regular secular college. So, which is now, uh, yeah, it's a college. It's not a university, it's a college. Four years now. I only went for two years, but Lord didn't have it in his plan for me to graduate with a degree of a bachelor's or whatever judges chapter six listen carefully this is could be you could change the names and make it america or europe and the children of israel did evil in the sight of the lord 
And the Lord delivered them into the hands, uh, hand of Midian seven years. Think about it, people. How's America or Europe any different? I mean, they took prayer and Bible reading out of public school where it had been for, you know, a couple hundred years. Harvard, Yale, Princeton were all started as Bible colleges. And when Harvard started teaching, uh, having a law school, their textbook was the book of Leviticus, the Bible. Now, Harvard has classes on anal sex. Really? And, and, and their president, I don't know if the present one, but they had a president that was an antichrist. He was very co-sure if you catch my drift. So here it is, a college that was founded as a Bible college has an antichrist for the president, or had. I don't know if he's still the president. But, you know, that tells you. Uh, America's had well over 50 million abortions, probably maybe 80 million abortions. I don't know. I was reading that there's between 2 and 3 million abortions every year since the 80s. Do the math. Sodomy is, sodomites can get married. Matter of fact, they have protection. Christians don't have protections, but the sodomites do. You know? Think the Lord's happy with all this stuff? And people, people love their Harry Potter and uh, the witchcraft on TV and in the movies and vampires and werewolves and Think the Lord's happy with all this? And then you got churches that care more about tithes than uh, they don't even know who Jesus is. The Mormons teach that Jesus is the brother of Satan. Jehovah Witnesses teach that Jesus is the bro um, uh, Michael the Archangel. Really? My Bible, the King James, says that Jesus created the angels. How could he be the brother of Satan or Michael the Archangel? And millions flock to this stuff. I mean, they don't even know who Jesus is. They think he's just some good guy that uh, knew some magic and was able to do some magic tricks and was just a good teacher. I mean... And then they wonder why everything's crashing and falling apart. Oh, yeah. And the children of Israel did evil in the sight of the Lord, and the Lord delivered them into the hands of Midian seven years. You could say the children of America did evil on the side of the Lord, and the Lord delivered them into the hands of the evil ones. No different. Verse 2. And the hand of Midian prevailed against Israel, and because of the Midianites, the children of Israel made them the dens which are in the mountains and caves and strongholds. What's a den? A place to live. You know, uh, uh, bears like to hibernate in their dens in the winter. The children of Israel had to live in the mountains, in caves, and strongholds. And so it was when the American farmers had sold that the, that the uh, wicked, evil ones came and took all their food. Oh, wait, no, that's the Bob translation. And so it was when Israel had sown, what, their crops, right? That the Midians came up and the Amalekites and the children of the east, even they came up against them and they encamped against them and destroyed the increase of the earth. So I guess whatever they didn't steal, they burned, probably. Uh, Till thou come unto Gaza and left no sustenance. What sustenance? Food. And left no sustenance for Israel, neither sheep, nor ox, nor ass. 
For they came up with their cattle and their tents, and they came as grasshoppers for multitude. For both they and their camels were without number, and they entered into the land to destroy it. Um, and you could be reading, um, and the heathen aliens flooded America and Europe to destroy it. People, you know, the book of Judges, nothing, uh, nothing's really changed, just the names. You know, it's verse six. And they entered into the land to destroy it. And Israel was greatly impoverished because of the Midianites. And the children of Israel cried unto the Lord. Ah, and that's what we need to do. And it came to pass when the children of Israel cried unto the Lord because of the Midianites that the Lord sent a prophet unto the children of Israel, which said unto them, Thus saith the Lord God of Israel. This is what we need today, people. A prophet from the Lord. Well, there's going to be two of them. Uh, Thus saith the Lord God of Israel, I brought you up from Egypt and brought you forth out of the house of bondage. And I delivered you out of the hand of the Egyptians and out of the hand of all that oppressed you and drave them out from before you and gave you their land. And I said unto you, I am the Lord your God. Fear not the gods of the Amorites in whose land ye dwell, but, but, there's always a, you know, that's what goats do. They but. But ye have not obeyed my voice. Huh. And there came an angel of the Lord and sat under an oak, which was an Ophrah that pertained unto Joash the Abizarite and his son Gideon. Gideon. And his son Gideon threshed wheat by the rime press to hide it from the Midianites. That's right. You better hide your. There's going to come a day you're going to have to hide in the woods your food to keep the heathen aliens from stealing it and destroying it. Verse 12. And the angel of the Lord appeared unto him and said unto him, The Lord is with thee, thou mighty man of valor. And Gideon said unto him, O my Lord, if the Lord be with us, why then is all this befallen us? And where be all his miracles which our fathers told us of, saying, Did not the Lord bring us up from Egypt? But now the Lord hath forsaken us. But now the Lord hath forsaken us. Well, you're half right, Gideon. But actually it was Israel that forsook the Lord. But now the Lord hath forsaken us and delivered us into the hands of the Midianites. And the Lord looked upon him and said, Go in this thy might, and thou shalt save Israel from the hand of the Midianites. Have not I sent thee? And he said unto him, O my Lord, wherewith shall I save Israel? Behold, my family is poor in Manasseh, and I am the least in my father's house. Wow, isn't that basically what David said, the king? He was the youngest. He was the least in his father's house. And yet the Lord chose King David to slay the giant. Verse 16, And the Lord said unto him, Surely I will be with thee, and thou shalt smite the Midianites as one man. Now, Gideon's probably like thinking, what the, you know, eh, all right, well, I can believe the promises of the Lord, but you're going to have to give me a sign here. And he said unto him, if now I have found grace in thy sight, then show me a sign that thou talkest with me. Depart not hence, I pray thee, until I come unto thee, and bring forth my present, and set it before thee. And he said, I will tarry until thou come again. 
And Gideon went in and made ready a kid and unleavened cakes of an ephah of flour. The flesh he put in a basket, and he put the broth in a pot, and brought it out unto him under the oak, and presented it. And the angel of God said unto him, Take the flesh and the eleven cakes, and lay them upon this rock, and pour out the broth. And he did so. Then the angel of the Lord put forth the end of the staff that was in his hand, and touched the flesh and the unleavened cakes. And there arose up fire, and there rose up fire out of the rock, and consumed the flesh and the unleavened cakes. Then the angel of the Lord departed out of his sight. And when Gideon perceived that he was an angel of the Lord, Gideon said, Alas, O Lord God, for because I have seen an angel of the Lord face to face. And the Lord said unto him, Peace be unto thee, fear not, thou shalt not die. Hmm. All right, let's read verse 24. Then Gideon built an altar there unto the Lord and called it Jehovah Shalom, which uh, Jehovah is how some people say is how you pronounce the name of the Lord. And Shalom means peace. So peace of the Lord or the Lord's peace. And called it Jehovah Shalom unto this day. It is yet in Ophrah of the Abi Zorites. And it came to pass that same night that the Lord said unto him, Take thy father's young bullock, even the second bullock of seven years old, and throw down, throw down the altar of Baal. Uh, Baal was just a name of a false satanic god. And throw down the altar of Baal that thy father hath, and cut down the grove that is by it. See, the grove of trees was defiled because they performed sacrifices there. Possibly animal sacrifices or human sacrifices. Verse 26. And build an altar unto the Lord thy God upon the top of this rock in the ordered place and take the second bullock and offer a burnt sacrifice with the wood of the grove which thou shalt cut down. Then Gideon took ten men of his servants and did as the Lord had said unto him, and so it was, because he feared his father's household and the men of the city, that he could not do it by day, that he did it by night. And when the men of the city arose early in the morning, and behold, the altar of Baal was cast down, and the grove was cut down that was by it, and the second bullock was offered upon the altar that was built. And they said one to another, who hath done this thing? And when they inquired and asked, they said, Gideon, the son of Joash, hath done this thing. Then the men of the city said unto Joash, Bring out thy son, that he may die, because he hath cast down the altar of Baal, and because he hath cut down the grove that was by it. And Joash said unto all that stood against him, Will ye plead for Baal? Will ye save him he that will plead for him let him be put to death whilst it is yet morning if he Baal if he be a god let him plead for himself because one hath cast down his altar good answer well, let let Baal defend Baal you know let this satanic god you threw down his altar well if if Baal's a god, let him defend himself. You know, that's basically what Joash is saying. Therefore on that day, he called him Jerubbabel, saying, Let Baal plead against him, because he hath thrown down his altar. Then all the Midianites and the Amalekites and the children of the east were gathered together and went out and went over and pitched in the valley of Jezreel. Remember, there's, there's been slaughters in the valley of Jezreel a few times. But the Spirit of the Lord came upon Gideon, and he blew a trumpet, and Abbey Ezer were, uh, was gathered after him. And he sent messengers throughout all Manasseh, 
who also was gathered after him. And he sent messengers unto Asher and unto Zebulun and unto Naphtali, and they came up to meet him. And Gideon said unto God, If thou wilt save Israel by mine hand, as thou hast said, Behold, I will put a fleece of wool in the floor, and if the dew be on the fleece only, and it be dry upon all the earth beside, then shall I know that thou wilt save Israel by mine hand, as thou hast said. So here it is, Gideon wants, he wants a sign from heaven. So if he puts the, the piece of wool down on the floor, but everything around the wool is dry, but the, the wool's moist with dew, that'll be a sign, right? Verse 38, And it was so, for he rose up early on the morning and thrust the fleece together and wringed the dew out of the fleece, a bowl full of water. And Gideon said unto God, Let not thine anger be hot against me, and I will speak but this once. Let me prove, I pray thee, but this once with this fleece. Let it now be dry only upon the fleece, and upon all the ground let there be dew. And God did so that night, for it was dry upon the fleece only, and there was dew on all the ground. If only we had a Gideon today to cast down all the altars of Baal. Do you know that there is the church of Satan did you know that? There's actually a church of Satan. It was founded on June 6, 1966. 6666. By a guy named Anton Levy. Oh, I'm, I'm sorry. He changed his name to LeVay. They'll try to tell you his name is Howard Stanton, but that's uh, fables. We have so many heathen temples in the United States, a country that was founded with people like Jonathan Edwards, who did a sermon called Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God. There was a pretty good revival in, the Amer uh, in America and the United States back then. Would to God we had somebody else like him today. So... Where is America today? Just like it was back in the days of Gideon. Heathens flood our lands with their false gods. I mean, let's face it, people. Every god is America, uh, welcome in America except the god of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob and his only begotten son, Jesus, who is the Christ. Ah, I was going to skip this, but I can't. Judges chapter 7. Then Jerubbabel, who is Gideon, and all the people that were with him, rose up early and, rose up early and pitched beside the well of Harod, so that the host of the Midianites were on the north side of them by the hill of Mor Morah in the valley. And the Lord said unto Gideon, the people that are with thee are too many for me to give the Midianites into their hands, lest Israel vaunt themselves against me, saying, Mine own hand hath saved me. In other words, you got too many people. You know, no. I don't want you guys thinking that uh, your swordsmanship saved, saved you. No. Too many people. Now, therefore, go and... And uh, go to proclaim in the ears of the people, saying, Whosoever is fearful and afraid, let him return and depart early from Mount Gilead. And there returned to the people twenty and two thousand, and there remained ten thousand. And the Lord said unto Gideon, The people are yet too many. Bring them down unto the water, and I will try them for thee there. And it shall be that of whom I say unto thee, This shall go with thee, the same shall go with thee, and of whomsoever I say unto thee, this shall not go with thee, the same shall not go. So he brought down the people of the water, and the Lord said unto Gideon, Every one that lappeth of the water with his tongue as a dog lappeth, him shalt thou set by himself. Likewise, every one that boweth down upon his knees to drink. 
And the number of them that lapped, putting their hand to their mouth, were 300 men. But all the rest of the people bowed down upon their knees to drink water. And the Lord said unto Gideon, By the 300 men that lapped will I save you, and deliver the Midianites into thine hand, and let all the other people go, every man, unto his place. So the people took victuals in their hands and their trumpets, and he sent all the rest of Israel, every man, unto his tent, and retained those 300 men, and the host of Midian was beneath him in the valley. And it came to pass the same night that the Lord said unto him, Arise, get thee down unto the host, for I have delivered it into thine hand. See, it hasn't even happened yet, and the Lord says, It's done. For I have delivered it into thine hand. But if thou fear to go down, go down with Furah, thy servant, down to the host, and thou shalt hear what they say, and afterward that uh shall thine hands be strengthened to go down unto the host. Then went he down with Furah, his servant, unto the outside of the armed men that were in the host. And the Midianites and the Amalekites and all the children of the east lay among, uh, I'm sorry, along in the valley like grasshoppers for multitude, and their camels were without number as the sand by the seaside for multitude. And when Gideon was come, behold, there was a man that told a dream unto his fellow and said, Behold, I dreamed a dream, and lo, a cake of barley bread tumbled into the host of Midian and came unto a tent and smote it that it fell and overturned it, that the tent lay along. And his fellow answered and said, This is nothing else save the sword of Gideon, the son of Joash, a man of Israel, for into his hand hath God delivered Midian and all the host. And it was so when Gideon heard the telling of the dream and the interpretation thereof that he worshipped, that he worshipped and returned unto the host of Israel and said, Arise, for the Lord hath delivered into your hand the host of Midian. And he divided the 300 men into three companies. And he put a trumpet in every man's hand with empty pitchers and lamps within the pitchers. And he said unto them, Look on me and do likewise, and behold, when I come to the outside of the camp, it shall be that as I do, so ye do. When I blow with a trumpet, I and all that are with me, then blow ye the trumpets on every side on all the camp, and say, The sword of the Lord and of Gideon. Now, there is a feast of holy day of the Lord called the Feast of Trumpets. And also, there will be seven trumpets blown, trumps, not Donald, in the book of Revelation. And the seventh one is at the end of the tribulation when the Lord returns in glory to kick out the devil and his children, the leaseholders of this present earth, and then the landlord is going to take his property back. Oh, yeah. So, trumpets have a lot of meaning in the Bible. I'm trying to think. Oh, remember the story of Jericho? Where they uh, went around the city seven times? I'm sorry, seven days and uh, then they went around seven times and the walls of the city of Jericho fell flat. Oh, yeah. And what happened to all the defenders that were on the walls? Well, I guess they got flattened. I don't know. All right, so let's go to verse. So he said, uh, so he says, blow the trumpets and say, the sword of the Lord and of Gideon, verse 19. So Gideon and the hundred men that were with him came unto the outside of the camp in the beginning of the middle watch, and they had but newly set the watch. And they blew the trumpets and brake the pitchers that were in their hands. And the three companies blew the trumpets and brake the pitchers and held the lamps in their left hands and the trumpets in their right hand to blow withal. And they cried, The sword of the Lord and of Gideon. 
And they stood every man in his place round about the camp, and all the hosts ran and cried and fled. And the three hundred men blew the trumpets, and the Lord set every man's sword against his fellow, even throughout all the host. And the host fled to Beth Shitta in Zerorath, and to the border of Abel Meholal unto Tabath. So basically, uh, all the Midianites. They all fought against each other. They thought that uh, the guy next to them was Gideon's army. So they all, they're all fighting with each other, killing each other. Gideon's men were just, you know, standing there, blowing the horn. All right, uh, let's see. Verse 23. And the men of Israel gathered themselves together out of Naphtali and out of Asher and out of all Manasseh and pursued after the Midianites. And Gideon sent messengers throughout all Mount Ephraim, saying, Come down against the Midianites and take before them the waters unto Beth Barah and Jordan. Then all the men of Ephraim gathered themselves together and took the waters unto Beth Barah and Jordan. And they took two princes of the Midianites, Oreb and Zeb. Can you imagine being called Zeb? And they slew Oreb upon the rock of Oreb, and Zeb they slew at the winepress of Zeb, and pursued Midian, and brought the heads of Oreb and Zeb to Gideon on the other side of Jordan. All right, let's skip around a little bit. Judges chapter 8, verse 22. Uh, he just, Gideon had just won a great battle. Then the men of Israel said unto Gideon, Rule thou over us, both thou and thy son, and thy son's son also, for thou hast delivered us from the hand of Midian. Verse 23. Judges 8.23. And Gideon said unto them, I will not rule over you, neither shall my son rule over you. The Lord shall rule over you. But that didn't last too long. All right, so... Uh, Verse 30, Judges 8, 30. And Gideon had three score and ten sons of his body begotten, for he had many wives. Oh, boy. That's uh, 70, 70 sons, and that doesn't even include the daughters he probably had. Uh, a lot of women, I guess, wanted to be uh, have Gideon as their husband. I couldn't imagine a lot of trouble, people. You know, every a lot of guys think um, having multiple wives would, you know, is a fantasy, right? But you know what? The like King David had for a problem. You've got all these sons from these different wives, all scheming because they all want to be king, and they're not beyond killing their other brothers so that they're closer in line, or so that they could become king and not have a somebody to threaten their succession to being king. You know, what happens if you got five wives and you got five sons from those five wives? You know, they're all fighting each other to see, well, I want to be king. No, I'm going to be king. And they're not beyond killing each other. And um, sadly, that... Um, that's what happened to Gideon, and that's what happened to King David. So, you think having a lot of wives would be a lot of fun? Yeah. Watching your kids kill each other? No thanks. All right, let's go to Judges 8, 33, 34, and 35 verses. Well, verse 32. And Gideon the son of Joash died in a good old age and was buried in the sepulcher of Joash's father in Ophrah of the Abizorites. And it came to pass as soon as Gideon was dead, oh yeah, that the children of Israel turned again and went a whoring after Balaam, the satanic god, and went a whoring after Balaam and made Baal Bereth their god. 
And the children of Israel remembered not the Lord their God, who had delivered them out of the hands of all their enemies on every side, neither showed they kindness to the house of Jerubbaal, which is uh, namely Gideon, according to all the kindness which he had showed unto Israel. That's a very common theme, people. All right, well, this is going to be the end of part two. All blessings, praise, glory, and honor to the God the Father and His only begotten Son, Jesus, who is the Christ, the Lamb of God slain before the foundation of the world. In Jesus' precious name, amen.